those of you who are going to stay for this next panel, please take a seat. It's 4.30 already, and we don't want to be behind schedule. Let me introduce our <laughs> moderator for this panel on medullary carcinoma, Dr. Uh, Elisa Rossili, and uh, uh, she will be introducing the speakers. So good afternoon to everybody. Uh, we will have this panel about medullary thyroid cancer in which we will discuss some aspect, of course, not everything because there is no so much time. Mainly <coughs> diagnosis, red screening, surgical treatment, and advanced cases. Um, we have here a group of <coughs> panelists. Uh, I realized that three of them are surgeons and just one is an endocrinologist, so we are a minority, Steve, but uh, we will go. So we have Dr. Jeff Molley, Steven Wagespach, sorry for the pronunciation of Perfect. your surname, but Jeremy Freeman and Rich Wong. So we will start with this case, the case of this lady, 38 years old, Occasional thyroid ultrasound. Maybe she went to the gynecologist and he decided to perform also an neck ultrasound. And he found a two centimeter thyroid nodule in her neck. This is the neck ultrasound of that nodule. And uh, the following uh, uh, controls and exams that the lady uh, was, done, was done demonstrated a normal thyroid function. A dedicated neck ultrasound confirms uh, the, the, the nodule, which uh, appears, uh, according to the classification of ATA, has uh, a 10, 20% intermediate suspicious. So she went through the uh, fine needle aspiration and the response was Bethesda 4 or Thai F. And uh, there was no family history for thyroid cancer. So the question here is now about calcitonin. This is a lady with a nodule suspicious for, to be a cancer. And my question to our panelists, uh, starting from Dr. Molly, is, do you measure calcitonin in all thyroid nodules or in some of them, in which occasion, which is your practice? Well, we measure the serum calcitonin if there was any family history or if there was any cytologic uh, features that suggested medullary thyroid carcinoma or if the patient had a personal history of any other of the components of the MEN syndromes. But, in general, we don't, we don't measure it routinely. I know that in other places they do. I think in Europe that's done much more commonly than here. And Dr. Freeman, do you or do you do when, for example, there is a case like this one? I just remember you that the, there was a suspicious of uh, uh, cancer, but we didn't know exactly what it was. I agree with Jeff. Um, there's no reason to do calcitonin as uh, far as North Americans are concerned. Uh, and I know that Europeans do it uh, more often, but uh, from a cost effectiveness point of view, your yield is going to be very small if you do calcitonins in all patients with thyroid nodularity. So hence, we don't do it. And what about Dr. Wang? If you know that, for example, this lady has also elevated the levels of calcitonin. Should you change your treatment or is, is independent from the values of calcitonin? Yeah, so, so in general, we, uh, we don't check calcitonin routinely either for the reasons already described. Um, if you check it, often you may find low levels of elevation, which could be attributable to other causes that are unrelated to medullary thyroid cancer, even things as simple as proton pump use or um, you know, kidney issues, um, even Hashimoto's thyroiditis can lead to low levels. If you do get one and it's very high, like say over 100, that is highly suggestive of medullary thyroid cancer. But I think that the statistical likelihood of getting that if you screen patients is, is very low. So we don't do that as, as routine practice. Okay. And Steve, what do you do in your 
practice yeah, as endocrinologist. So you, you <laughs> see the patients before the surgeon. So what do you do? Yeah, we, we don't routinely uh, check it in all thyroid nodules. I mean, the, the one exception could potentially be this case where you have indeterminate cytology and a suspicious uh, ultrasound. Um, but even then, we don't uh, convent, you know, typically do that in all cases. But certainly, this is a patient who's going to go to surgery nevertheless. Um, the question really is, if you suspected MTC, it might change your surgical approach. OK. So the, the question to measure or not to measure calcitonin, it appears to be a problem, routinely, I mean, a problem of cost effectiveness, because probably you can have so few cases of medullary detected by calcitonin with respect to the big number of nodules that you have. So what do we know from the literature? The story of calcitonin starting many years ago, and we contributed a lot to this story. This is an old study uh, that we performed in our institution in which we measure calcitonin uh, uh, on a routine basis on uh, patients with nodular disease. And uh, we found eight cases with elevated levels of calcitonin, and they were all medullary thyroid cancer. So the prevalence is uh, rather low, as expected. But what was interesting at, at that time, this was a paper of uh, a study of 1991, is that these eight cases were not all detected as medullary thyroid cancer by fine needle aspiration. In some cases, uh, the fine needle aspiration showed the presence of a carcinoma, but not better identified. In some cases, uh, uh, it, uh, it even detected a benign nodule. And this uh, is uh, uh, the uh, story of the cost effectiveness. Indeed, the only study uh, that uh, really, um, uh, how can I say, take into consideration the cost effectiveness of this routine measurement of serum calcitonin in nodular disease is this one that is from United States and Canada. And uh, the, the result is that the routine uh, serum detection of calcitonin is cost effective like or uh, similar to the breast cancer uh, mammography, so screening for breast cancer, coloscopy, and uh, uh, other screening. So indeed, there is no this big, huge problem of the cost effectiveness. In my opinion, the real problem of calcitonin, and I would like to know your opinion, is the problem of the specificity. There are a lot of assays that are low specific, and they can have uh, more detectable levels uh, of calcitonin. If you have this kind of uh, values, uh, like, I don't know, 30, 35, or even 20 before surgical treatment, what would you do, Steve? Do you care? You don't care? Well, I don't check it, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but. My understanding is that really with levels less than 100, typically some type of stimulation test is, is recommended, which would argue perhaps against cost effectiveness um, in widespread screening. Um, or you could consider another biopsy with calcitonin washout on the needle or you know, staining the, the cells for calcitonin or chromogranin or something of that nature or molecular testing now that you know, involves uh, potentially identifying medullaries through that process. But all that adds to the cost and burden to the patient and the healthcare system. Okay, so and the question for surgeon is, uh, do you think that to know before surgery that this is, is a medullary thyroid cancer can change your attitude uh, in uh, or type of surgical treatment, the two one. Yes, if, if we knew in advance that we're a medullary, I'd be more inclined to do a total thyroidectomy and a central compartment nodal dissection. Um, one of the points that Steve brought up, I think, is important that you know in this era of molecular cytology, where a lot of Bethesda three and Bethesda four lesions, particularly small ones, may be considered reasonable targets for molecular profiling. A lot of the platforms do have specific medullary panels, including the Pharma, GEC, and Thyroseq, 
So if you do send for one of those, often uh, there'll be a specific medullary output, which could be very informative in these types of cases. Okay. So the reason for which I am stressing this point is because this is a quite a recent study. This is a multicentric study from center in the United States and in Europe in which uh, more than 245 sporadic medullary thyroid cancer have been collected, data have been collected from 12 different institutions in different nations and continents. And what they observe is that uh, uh, in the majority of cases, I would say um, more than 50% of cases, there was the, the, the um, diagnosis, because the diagnosis was not done before the surgical treatment, the surgical treatment was not done appropriately because we know that the appropriate surgical treatment for medullary is total thyroidectomy and central neck dissection. And as you can see in this slide, only 46% of these patients got the right uh, surgical treatment. So um, the, to know that calcitonin is uh, uh, present and that can help you in uh, making a preoperative diagnosis of medullary can help the surgeon to do the right, uh, the right uh, uh, treatment. There is also the, the question of the multifocality of the sporadic cases. In the past, we say that multifocality was mainly for, um, for uh, um, hereditary cases. Indeed, there are studies, and this is one of these, quite recent, in which it has been demonstrated that around, let's say, roughly 10% of sporadic cases can be multifocal. So nowadays that we perform sometimes lobectomy. What would you do, Dr. Molle, if you discover that your nodule after an hemithyroidectomy is a medullary thyroid cancer? Would you do a completion or, or not? Well, it would depend on a number of factors. The first thing we would do would be to check a calcitonin level, you know, a couple of weeks after the surgery, because if it's not elevated, you could argue that maybe you don't have to take the other side out. And certainly there is a lot of published experience with unilateral surgery for medullary thyroid carcinoma with Dr. Miyauchi in um, Kobe, Japan. Um, you'd also want to, to uh, investigate the possibility that it's hereditary disease. So. In a patient like this, we would always get genetic testing for RET mutations, and uh, we have, for instance, one patient who, you know, this came back, she did come back having uh, familial medullary thyroid carcinoma, one of the MEN uh, mutations, and um, uh, however, she had a nerve injury on the side of her lobectomy because she's, she'd had previous, multiple previous parathyroidectomies. So here we have a patient now who's got the nerve out on the right side where we took uh, the lobe out. She's got a working nerve on the left side. Um, she's got MEN2, but she's got a normal calcitonin. So up to now, we have just observed this patient. Uh, she's very uh, reliable, and she follows up diligently. But, you know, there are all kinds of factors that, that can influence your management of these people. And uh, um, Dr. Miyauchi, you know, he wouldn't recommend any, for any more surgery if the calcitonin's normal either. You know. Okay, but for Dr. Freeman, do you continue in, in such a case, case in which you perform just lobectomy uh, and calcitonin, postoperative calcitonin is, let's say, normal? Would you continue to follow with the calcitonin measurement uh, or you stop the control of calcitonin after a while? I mean, how do you follow the kind of patients like this? Yeah. And just to follow up on what Jeff said, you know, these patients have to be worked up for uh, disseminated disease, for MEN1, MEN2, their family has to be checked out. And if all of that is, uh, and, you know, this happens with frequency because we oftentimes get patients who have had lobectomy in the periphery, uh, in the community hospitals, and uh, here we are on our doorstep. So um, if everything is otherwise uh, negative, 
then we don't recommend going back and doing completion surgery. We would follow those patients with calcitonin uh, perhaps every six months, uh, to see, and, and CEA, by the way, to see if there's uh, any rise in those. And if there is a rise, we again would um, investigate them appropriately. Okay. And Dr. Wong, do you think that this kind of patients could be useful to perform a stimulation test, a calcium stimulation test, or not? Yes, I, I think it's useful, but um, I agree with what both Jeremy and Jeff has said. I think that if there's no pressing need to do the surgery now, I think there'll be very little loss if you monitor them. If the calcitonin is very low and there's nothing structural, you can monitor them. If the calcitonin starts to climb and then you see something appear in the central compartment, then at that point you can do your completion, your central nodal dissection, and I don't think you'll be necessarily any worse off at that point. Well, if you have a normal calcitonin, would you do a central node dissection? And you have something structural that appears? Oh, if you didn't have anything structural. No. Just, just a, uh, yeah. Uh, just I wouldn't do any thing. surgery. If, if there's calcitonin is normal, there's nothing structural, I would just calcitonin, monitor. I would yeah. monitor alone. And, it's not heredi and if it's not hereditary. I just want to point out a slip of the tongue Jeff pointed out to me. I said MEN1. I meant MEN2. Okay. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> yes. They realize was. Okay. So... These are the recommendations about serum. Can, yeah. can I add a so, comment? Yeah. <laughs> so, so I think one assumption that we all work with, but not really proven, is that the lack of the initial definitive surgery doesn't necessarily mean these patients are going to die of medullary cancer. And so I think, you know, in the absence of the appropriate surgery up front, it doesn't necessarily mean, one, that patient's going to do poorly, or two, that you can't salvage them down the road. And, and also, obviously, our skilled surgeons intraoperatively, you know, should be able to identify um, clinically relevant central node metastases and, and hopefully, you know, do the right surgery at that time. And that's something important to remember, too, in, in someone going to surgery with a plan for lobectomy with an indeterminate lesion that could be medullary cancer. Okay. Thank you so much. Did you, did you say that surgeons can identify central <laughs> node metastases? Clinically well, relevant. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not microscopic, but, yeah. you know... Because we can't. I mean, we publish that, so it's about 64% of the time we are correct about a node's status, positive or negative. Whereas, it, so that, you know, if you think something has cancer in it, you're only going to be right 64% of the time. You're going to be wrong. Uh, anyway, we published this years ago. It's also true in breast cancer in the axilla that it's not, it's, it's fairly inaccurate. The surgeon's judgment is fairly inaccurate as to whether a node is positive or not. Okay. So you rely on ultrasound and on what the calcitonin is. If the calcitonin is not elevated, if it's like 5 or 10, then the patient probably does not have central node metastases. But maybe you should take the central nodes out at that time because you don't want to have to go back in there later on because of the parathyroid. So you want to probably do everything up front. There are different reasons to, to proceed that way. Um, but uh, I think that the calcitonin level is what really helps you, uh, you know, gives you, guides you as to how much you need to do. And then, of course, the ultrasound, which we always get on the day of surgery or the day before, mark nodes that are suspicious. So just to make a point, according to the uh, ETA recommendation about serum calcitonin, as you can see in this recommendation, the panel cannot recommend either for or against the routine measurement of a serum calcitonin in patients with thyroid nodules. After 20 years, we still do not have an agreement on this specific issue. Probably it's, we can do uh, we can choose to measure or not to measure. It depends on your institutional attitude. Um, but um, let's say that there was, they say they wrote, they write in the, in the guidelines that there was, however, an agreement that the serum calcitonin may be considered in the subgroup of patients in whom an elevated calcitonin may change the diagnostic or surgical approach. Uh, so this is why I was uh, uh, asking to our surgeons how much the uh, knowledge of an elevated levels of calcitonin can, um, how can I say, um, impact on their uh, surgical strategy. Um, so the, the issue remains controversial. Uh, the idea is that if you measure calcitonin 
you have to pay attention to the uh, low specificity of this kind of measurement, but to have an elevated level of calcitonin can at least induce you to perform other um, examination, like Steve said, the, the measurement of calcitonin and the washout of the needle that you use for fine needle aspiration, and then to decide if you want to, with the surgeon, which kind of uh, surgical <coughs> treatment you want to perform in this patient. So, let's say that the calcitonin is, uh, was measured in this lady, and it was 190 picogram per milliliter. How was your feeling, uh, Steve, in this, uh, uh, taking into account the serum calcitonin, and do you uh, feel that the level of calcitonin is important too? Sure, um, so I think this would make a more definitive diagnosis of MTC, um, given the calcitonin over 100, given this ultrasonographic. So, what, um, sorry to interrupt you. So 100 is? From my understanding of the literature, is, yeah. is, okay. but again, I don't have cl real world clinical experience okay. um, with that necessarily. Um, and the level is helpful because it would suggest uh, a lower, uh, assuming this is not a poorly differentiated medullary carcinoma, um, it would suggest a lower volume of disease, and of course the lateral neck lymph nodes would need to be interrogated very well. Um, but this could very well be disease localized to that lobe of the thyroid. Okay, so Dr. Molly, if you know that this lady has uh, this kind of value of calcitoni, what do you do? Well, the, um Dr. Henning Drolley is in the audience, and he has written a lot on this, uh, how we use calcitonin levels to kind of guide, to predict which nodal compartments are um, involved. And I think that he and his group you mostly use the calcitonin level to determine the extent of their surgery. Please forgive me if I'm wrong, Henning. But we also use ultrasound, and uh, uh, I think if our general rules are if the patient has a calcitonin of less, less than 50, it's unlikely that they're going to have uh, central node metastases, but we usually still do a central node dissection for the reasons I mentioned before, that you want to get all that done and preserve the parathyroids when you have the chance to. Uh, there's some argument as to when you need to do a lateral neck dissection, that is to remove the uh, lymph nodes lateral to the carotid artery on that side. and. Um, uh, I, I think if the calcitonin is over 200, it's reasonable to do a lateral neck dissection. And, uh, you know, some people might argue uh, if, the if the ultrasound is normal, why would you do that? Like Doug Evans, he's not, I don't know if he's here either, but I think he would argue that you don't need to do a lateral neck dissection if the ultrasound is normal. Uh, and again, I apologize if I'm, uh, I'm not representing him correctly. But in this patient, I would certainly do a lateral neck dissection and a central neck dissection and a total thyroidectomy. And I would transplant the parathyroids on the side of the tumor uh, into the probably the sternocleidomastoid muscles. But of course, first, you get metanephrines, make sure they don't have a pheochromocytoma, and that sort of thing. Okay. And Dr. Freeman, Dr. Wong, do you agree? Do you have other opinions? Yeah, I, I was actually going to quote Henning Drollo's paper, and um, he gave a beautiful talk at our last World Congress on his management, uh, which is um, also, in addition to imaging driven, is also driven by the level of uh, calcitonin. And um, given a calcitonin of uh, about 190, 200, and that sort of area, that is uh, very suspicious at times for lateral neck disease. So um, all things being equal, if this is just the only positive finding in addition to the fine needle aspirate, imaging is negative, I would still go ahead and do a total thyroidectomy, central neck, and uh, ipsilateral lateral neck dissection. And Dr. Wong, well, I see, you... I, I see Dr. Jolly right there. And um, Dr. Jolly's paper with Dr. Machens was really, I think, a, an incredible feat. Um, he looked at a very large group of patients, and all of them had um, total thyroidectomy and bilateral nodal dissections, and he, they dissected out at the different cutoff levels what the risk was for there being metastatic nodal disease in the various compartments. And the, the, the end result of that was that they used those cutoffs to help guide European recommendations. In the ATA, I think it was a lot more of a difficult um, consensus. 
But I think that um, according to the work that he did, um, they recommended lateral ipsilateral neck dissection at relatively low calcitonin levels. I think it was like 20 or more. And at 200, they were recommending contralateral lateral neck dissections. Okay, so we're talking about something a whole grade more. Um, for many years, I would just do total thyroidectomy central nodal dissection and no lateral neck dissection in the absence of any any um, radiographic evidence of lateral neck disease, because it really escalates the level of the surgery. But with this data, I think it's definitely worth a conversation with the patient about the risk levels. And you may be surprised at what your different patients may choose. Some patients may want to have more surgery to have a higher chance of biochemical cure, which Dr. Drally also outlined very nicely in his paper, the different cutoffs at which biochemical cure would, could be achieved. In contrast, um, other patients may not want to have more surgery if it's not necessary and may prefer a careful observational approach, understanding that a subset of them will need surgery later on. But it's very hard to show that that is going to lead to worse overall survival outcomes. I don't think anyone can show that one. So I think it's a, it's a nuanced decision, and, and it was a, it's a good case to discuss. Steve, would you, let's say that this lady uh, perform just a thyroid ultrasound. What do you would do before sending her to surgeon? So just the thyroid ultrasound. So, so she would need a more comprehensive cervical yeah. ultrasound yeah. to look for you know abnormal lateral neck lymph nodes. With this level of calcitonin, it is not clearly recommended that you need to look beyond the neck um, to to look for you know distantly metastatic disease. Um, in the absence of ultrasound sonographic findings suggestive of malignant lymphadenopathy, you know, I doubt a CT would add very much information, but certainly some people may, may prefer to do that. Okay. So, but the, 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 and I come back to the surgeon. The results of the neck ultrasound, if the neck ultrasound is negative, okay, this can change your attitude or, or not, or still you. Uh, take into consideration the levels of calcitonin. Yes, yes means that negative neck ultrasound, these levels of calcitonin, which kind of uh, well, treatment? We, we do also complement the ultrasound with the CT scan, and if both of those are negative, um, my, my pattern of practice has been basing neck um, management uh, on, CT, on uh, calcitonin levels. And given that calcitonin level, I think that patient merits at least an ipsilateral neck dissection, if not a bilateral neck dissection. Okay. But I, I, in this particular case, I would just do uh, an ipsilateral so, neck but dissection. So, in any case, you treat the lateral, ipsilateral? Yes, based on the calcitonin level. Okay. Steve? So, I, I'm going to present a different approach. Um, so, we, we would not do ipsilateral. Uh, lateral neck at, at my institution. Um, so a few few caveats. One, this level of calcitonin is entirely consistent with a two plus centimeter medullary carcinoma. Two is, I don't know if we've ever met a medullary patient that makes calcitonin and it's less than 20. So that basically would indicate that all medullary cancer patients require ipsilateral lateral neck dissection, which I think is, is over treatment. Third is that people who relapse and ultimately die of medullary cancer will not die of lateral neck disease. They will die of distant metastases. And so I, you know, we see no reason to do prophylactic lateral neck dissections uh, without imaging evidence for disease. Another point is we all know that once medullary is in uh, the lymph nodes, it's very hard to make those patients calcitonin negative. Um, and finally, I want to point out work by Dr. Zaffario in our group that looked at this exact question and found really no difference in outcomes between those who've had prophylactic ipsilateral lateral versus those um, that had it uh, for, for um, other reasons. So, so with all that said, um, you know, our argument is that that is unnecessary surgery in this type of situation. Okay. So these were the questions, and this is the famous paper that they were talking about, is the paper from Dr. Dral, in which uh, this is, I think, one of the best on this specific uh, issue. Uh, they treated the 300 patients with uh, total thyroidectomy and systematic uh, uh, dissection of uh, central compartment plus the ipsilateral lateral cervical dissection in uh, 
227 patients, so the majority of these. And in 217 patients, uh, they also perform the contralateral uh, dissection. And uh, so they could verify in these patients uh, the extension of the disease in the lymph nodes of the neck. And they make a correlation with the levels of the calcitonin, presalgical calcitonin. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, from here is not easy to, to be uh, uh, observed, but there are a lot of uh, very important information. For example, that uh, only cases with very low levels of calcitonin has no um, node metastasis. But at the same time, if we concentrate on the cases uh, having a level of calcitonin between 100 and 200, that is uh, uh, the case that we are playing uh, which uh, you can see that uh, in uh, almost uh, a tw 27, 30 percent of them, there are lymph node mats in the central compartment and ipsilateral central compartment, but also in the contralateral central compartment. And there were also uh, metastases in the lateral cervical compartment, but I would say, I don't know if I can say only, but in any case, it's only in 15% of cases. So uh, it's a matter of uh, uh, decision uh, how much the surgeon want to extend the surgical treatment. And of course, I think that is very much dependent on the skills of the surgeon. What do you suggest, Dr. Molly? Should these uh, patients be centralized uh, in, uh, in uh, I can say, centers that are uh, with big volume, yeah. or can they be treated everywhere? I see what you're saying. There, so should the patient have the surgery done at a tertiary institution with expertise in this problem? I think that's very true for certain things. For instance, MEN2B babies who are, you know, or, or babies who are having pre uh, preventative surgery uh, for MEN2A 634 mutations or MEN2B, those should really only be done in certain very few centers in this country where the uh, surgeons are extremely experienced with that. A case like this, um, I'm not so convinced that it has to be done in a uh, tertiary center. It probably would be best if it was because the, ultrasonogra the ultrasonographers have a, uh, expertise with um, looking at nodes in the neck for a metastatic disease, uh, whereas a community ultrasonographer who's maybe doing uh, you know, gallbladder and breast all day long and only does an occasional thyroid, and then you ask them to do a, a, a lateral neck ultrasound, it may be sort of out of the blue for them. Um, but, you know, there are plenty of surgeons who I think could do a, a lateral neck dissection. The, the issue is who can do a, an effective central neck dissection, because that's something that I think mainly endocrine surgeons have the most expertise with. Uh, preservation of the parathyroids. My experience has been that uh, head and neck surgeons, ENT trained surgeons, are not as good at, at preserving parathyroid function uh, as uh, with the exception of the uh, gathered uh, uh, surgeons in this room, of course. But um, so, yeah, that's a complicated question. But yeah, I think it's always better to be taken care of in a tertiary center if you have a, uh, you, if you have a problem that is rare like this. Okay, so I want to just say about uh, this uh, paper that I like very much, that unfortunately there is no correlation with neck ultrasound. This is the major, uh, I, I mean, limit of, of the paper and it could be useful to know if these cases that were positive for, for lymph node metastasis were already positive at the neck ultrasound or not. But uh, this will be the next paper that Dr. Dral will show us. Uh, the problem of this kind of, of treatment are the complications. Of course, in the hand of a good surgeon, complications are relatively low. But anyway, they had 22% of transient hypoparathyroidism, 5% of transient recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy, 
and 6% uh, permanent complication, including uh, hypoparathyroidism. So this is uh, the, the, the real uh, concern about this kind of, uh, of uh, um, uh, surgical treatment. And of course it is known, and I conclude this, uh, this uh, paper with this uh, sentence, that many complications occurred as a function of the number of lymph nodes removed. So I think that we have to make a balance uh, uh, according to the neck ultrasound and also taking care of the value of calcitonin. Uh, um, of course, nowadays we have uh, neck ultrasound that can, as Steve was saying, can help very much in uh, finding and distinguish the uh, um, lymph, uh, lymph node metastasis. And if we have uh, a lymph node that is uh, suspicious for metastasis, uh, Steve, what do you do? Uh, we would do a biopsy. And? We're not quite necessarily doing washouts, <laughs> but that, that is another potential, if that's what you're getting at. <laughs> okay, yes, I was teasing you, of course, because we can measure calcitonin, but also thyroglobulin if we are in the setting of a papillary thyroid cancer in the washout of the needle to be sure that... Uh, yeah, usually, even though the cytopathology, I mean, usually it's fairly straightforward on the cytopath of a cervical lymph node. Um, you know, yeah. in terms of the diagnosis uh, yeah. for medullary. And the now in this example, the lymph node uh, is uh, already metastatic at the neck ultrasound. Sometimes there are some lymph nodes that are a little bit more or less uh, uh, clear and uh, maybe a, a measurement of calcitonin or thyroglobulin can be useful. Uh, yes, so uh, lymph nodes in the central compartment, unfortunately, are not uh, uh, well detectable or easily detectable with the neck ultrasound uh, when the thyroid is still there. So we have to take into consideration that neck ultrasound is helpful mainly for the lateral cervical compartments. However, the question for Sergeant, do you believe or do you feel or which is your experience when the medullary thyroid cancer has already um, involved lymph nodes in the neck, do you think that the surgical treatment can be really, uh, can really cure the, the, the patient or you can have uh, some doubts? Dr. Freeman. The pathologist sent you the report and uh, they found uh, uh, nodes metastasis, in, especially in the lateral cervical compartment. What do, which is your feeling about this disease? You know, certainly uh, the presence of uh, lateral lymph nodes in the, in the setting of a medullary thyroid cancer bumps up these patients to another risk strata. But, um, uh, you know, we, we've had uh, a huge number of cures, um, biochemically and, um, and anatomically, by doing lateral neck dissection. So, sure, I mean, we, we wouldn't do it unless we thought we could cure the patient, and we do cure the patient in a significant number of instances by doing lateral and central neck dissection. But, you know, I'm sorry, I, don't mean, I know you didn't call me, but these patients, if they die, they die from one of two things. They either die from central recurrence or they die from the dwindles from distant metastases. So if we are diligent about keeping the neck uh, free of disease, and I mean the central neck, you know, uh, Steve mentioned the fact that lateral neck dis uh, disease is not as morbid, but uh, we're preventing that. So I, I don't almost never see a patient die from a central local uh, c recurrence of, of medullary or any other th kind of thyroid cancer uh, anymore because we're uh, taking it out. Whereas back at, when I was a resident, we would see these patients come in all the time to the emergency room. Now their trachs changed or bleeding from something and central recurrence and death from it was a common thing. So I think that uh, the surgeons in general in this country are doing a pretty good job of preventing uh, that uh, road to mortality, the, lo the central recurrence road. The question that I posed is because sometimes we say that a good surgical treatment uh, can cure the patients and 
I, I feel that Sergeant, uh, I can say, suffer the responsibility to cure the patients. What do you think, Dr. Wong? Yeah, so um, when I see a patient with multiple neck nodal metastases, and if we do a meticulous neck dissection and the calcitonin drops dramatically, I am still fearful because in my experience, it climbs slowly again if you watch them carefully and long enough. And if you don't discharge them and not think about them, if you see them back again and again over the years, it climbs again. And um, in Dr. Dr. Drolley's paper, he had a whole list. You didn't show it, but um, the next list was of the biochemical cures, which I really thought was, was very, very well done. But I, I wonder if you were to follow those patients even longer, if those numbers that he showed, which were quite, quite powerful and, mm -hmm. and optimistic, I wonder if they may diminish if you watch them longer. So, Steve, the, the patients, patients don't, don't die from an elevated calcitonin level, though. Say again. I'd say patients don't die from an elevated calcitonin level. You but she's asking you, the you question about... You can't get carried away worrying so about that. No, I mean, no, no, but, but you're I, talking about cure. The, she's talking the, about recurrence. Yeah, well, the word cure is very, very... is probably not appropriate in, in this situation. I mean, biochemical cure, meaning you get the calcitonin down to normal, but you just said you've seen patients who recurred even after their pentagastrin-stimulated calcitonin went down to zero. That's pretty unusual. So I, I think, you know, it's important to, to, to maintain some rationality about this. Somebody with a slowly rising calcitonin level uh, and no disease on imaging is probably going to live a very, very long time. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure that you're going to see many of those patients die quickly from metastatic medullary thyroid carcinoma. So we try not to get the patients too uh, worked up about these, these numbers, you know, because that's all it is is a number. So, Steve, if you have a patient already treated by surgery coming to you after three months from surgery with a, uh, a pathological report showing mats in the lateral cervical compartment, what do you say to your patients when sh he or she should come back to visit you? If uh, they have to come back to visit you, what do they have to do? So basically, we, we have a, a, a frank discussion about, you know, the likelihood of long-term cure, biochemical cure or otherwise, in the setting of lateral neck disease is, is low in reality. And so we start to have a discussion about the likely chronicity of this disease and the fact that we'll be meeting each other over the years. Um, at this point, we would just, you know, focus on neck ultrasound and calcitonin and CE levels every six months every to begin six with. Months. Yeah to start with. And what about the magic number of 150 picogram per milliliter? <laughs> what do you think about that magic number? Can you explain us what is this magic number? Sure. So um, basically, in, in the guidelines and based on data, it's been recommended that if the calcitonin after initial appropriate surgery um, is 150 or higher, that one should embark on um, looking for distant metastatic disease and more comprehensive staging of the patient, which typically will include you know, CT neck chest, imaging of the liver, either MRI or liver phase or liver uh, enhanced um, CT, as well as looking at the axial skeleton primarily with MRI to look for skeletal and pelvic metastases. And Dr. Freeman, if during the follow-up the patient uh, show up new lymph nodes in the same region or in the contralateral region, do you feel that is, which kind of a, a, a suggestion will you give to your patient to operate again, second surgery, what do you think about? Still the disease is only in the neck. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, as, as I do more and more of this, as I, as I live longer and longer, I, I sort of um, uh, think of medullary thyroid cancer akin to adenoid cystic carcinoma, and that is it's a slow, long progression, and the patient can expect to live with disease, live with this chronicity for a long time. Having said that, um, generally when patients return with operable uh, regional lymphadenopathy, our tendency, not our tendency, our, our policy has been to remove as much uh, operative disease as possible 
uh, and with the hope that we've removed it all. Now I know there's a lot of verbiage in the literature about biochemical cure after redo, um, uh, redo lymphadenectomy in the neck. And there's a, Jeff, Jeff has got a paper on this, Dr. Drolla does, Dr. Tissiel does, and the number 35 keeps popping up in my mind. 35% of these patients are cured. And I'm wondering uh, whether or not they're long term, if one keeps following their uh, calcitonins, whether that 35 just drops down to almost zero, and it, I'm, I'm suspecting it probably does. So whilst we're giving them uh, palliation, if you will, in the neck for long term, uh, in the long term, uh, I don't think we're curing a lot of these patients with recurrent disease. It, in, well, Henning and I have published, you know, long-term follow-up on these patients. I had a 10-year follow-up paper a couple of years ago where um, out of 100 and some odd patients we, uh, who were biochemically cured at the time of the procedure, about 35% of them were still biochemically cured at 10 years. Uh, but about 50% of them just had a sort of a slowly increasing right. calcitonin level. Uh, Henning might want to comment on his experience with this, but I think getting a biochemical cure is a pretty good sign that the patient's going to be around for a long, long time, and, and you know, we just try not to get the patients too excited about the fact that they have a mildly elevated calcitonin yeah, level. Yeah, they so. probably still have disease, I would say. Well, they do, and, yeah. but they're not going to, if they're not going to die from, about it, uh, from it, who cares? And that I, I think just, yeah. just as a parting comment, I think that's not to dissuade us from uh, doing surgical uh, procedures on these recurrent lymph nodes. And Dr. Wong, if the patient is young enough to have a third recurrence in the neck, how many, how many treatments, surgical treatments do you think you can yeah, you do or you can suggest? There is any number after which you stop or you there, there's no magic number it depends on what was done before but it's th this is the reason why we want to try to make each compartment that we clean out as clean as possible and not to do little picking here and there and try to consolidate the care at a, at a place at a high volume center this is another reason why we're very reluctant to go to external beam radiation or too early because that makes subsequent surgery so difficult so the, the key is really to, to plan the surgeries to be meticulous and to do them as, as needed and to try to minimize the number of, of trips to the OR. But in some cases where patients have long and complicated histories, we see them back and we, we do another operation. And of course the risks of the operation continue to grow to the recurrent laryngeal nerves, the parathyroids, and to other structures with more scar tissue and more distortion and uh, it becomes more difficult progressively. Okay, so just to make sort of conclusion, if you know that there is a patient like this one with elevated levels of calcitonin, you care about the level of calcitonin to plan the surgical treatment. And if I well understood, we all agree about the central compartment dissection, and then for the lateral, it's a little bit dependent. Uh, uh, somebody do it uh, by principle, some others according to the neck ultrasound. Is that correct? We do agree? Okay. So now we change subject and we enter into the discussion of the red genetic screening that we already uh, touched indeed. This is a man, 42 years old, operated on for medullary thyroid cancer. There were no other major diseases. He has two children, eight and four years old, one brother, one sister, and the father and mother still alive. There is no familial history of thyroid disease in general, with the exception of the sister who was known to have an Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So the question is, this is a, a case of apparently sporadic uh, medullary thyroid cancer. Would you perform the red genetic screening for germline mutation despite the apparent sporadic nature, Dr. Molley? No. If the parent with medullary thyroid carcinoma is negative for the mutation, the only way their children could have the mutation would be if it was a not autosomal dominant or if the, if the uh, parent was a chimera. And chim chimerism has been reported in neurofibromatosis, but I'm not aware of any reports of chimerism in MEN2. So, Steve? 
So, uh, you know, your group and others have nicely shown that there is a, a, a not trivial percentage of apparently sporadic MTC patients who harbor germline mutations. I can't remember the exact percent, 30, uh, 20? In our series, no, no, in our series is around 7, 8 percent. 7, 8 percent, I'm yeah. sorry. So, it, 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 so, yes, so to answer the question simply, yes, uh, this you would be would. appropriate to refer for genetic counseling and germline RET testing. And what about? Yes, yes we, we send everybody, everybody, because you, you just don't know. You just don't know for no, Wait sure. a second. I'm sorry. Was the question, of course, the primary patient has to be tested. I thought the question yeah. was, do you test their children also if no, he's no. negative? No, no. no he said the, the First question patient. is about the case, the man who is apparently sporadic. Do you routinely perform the red genetic screening for germline mutation in this case? Yes, on, on, the, on the index case, index absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But if he's negative, then we wouldn't test his no, of course, first degree of course. relatives. But the, the, I'm sorry, this, I, thought the, that, I thought that was what you asked. Okay, we, we realized, but we didn't want to. So. Yes, and this is what uh, Steve was saying, that we performed a study on a quite big number of sp apparently sporadic cases of medullary thyroid cancer, and we found that uh, 7.5, but also there are other series in the literature that in which the percentage change vary from 5 to 10 percent, in which they have indeed, uh, they had indeed a germline mutation, and they didn't know and uh, thanks to this uh, screening, we could screen also um, 146 relatives, and among them, 60 were red positive, and uh, 35 of them were already affected. They even didn't know. So the red screening in apparently sporadic cases is important not only for the patient itself, but mainly for the for the relatives because uh, uh, it appears that there are cases uh, probably indolent, maybe in the future we will end up that these are indolent cases, but there, are, there were relatives with the disease and they didn't even know about their uh, status. And uh, what the, the guidelines say about this? Well, they say that uh, the recommendation is to test for germline mutation, all cases uh, with medullary thyroid cancer, because we can somehow change the story of the, the other relatives in the family, because we can uh, found them uh, um, when the disease is still uh, uh, not, uh, not clinically evident. Uh, if the, the, the men that we were talking about was red positive. And uh, we test the children, and one of them is uh, uh, positive. <laughs> Do you uh, send the child immediately to the, they were, one was six and the other was uh, four years old. Dr. Molly. Do you think that uh, the child should be operated on immediately at that age, or what do you uh, care about? It depends on what the mutation is. If they have a codon 918 mutation, which is MEN2B, they should be, uh, you know, you should check a calcitonin, of course, but, uh, and do whatever workup is necessary. But uh, in general, we try and take the thyroid out of those patients in infancy, or as certainly as young as possible. In patients with codon 60, 34 mutations, they should be operated on uh, at a fairly young age. We, I just did a patient with this, an 18-month-old with a codon 634 mutation last month who had macroscopic medullary thyroid carcinoma in the gland. On the other hand, in Missouri, the most common mutation is the codon 609Y mutation. And we have families where, you know, grandma's still alive at 78, and she has a mutation, and she's doing just fine. And those patients, we tend to follow them and uh, offer them surgery in their uh, teens. Um, a lot of these patients are not compliant. You know, they'll disappear uh, for years and, and show up later with high calcitonin and bulky disease. But uh, it's hard to predict how the, the disease is going to behave. So it's very mutation specific. And I'm sorry, Jeremy, but we do have to talk codons and, uh, <laughs> here. And uh, it's important to understand what mutation the patient has and what the, what, how the disease has behaved in other family members. Uh, but if it's a non-compliant patient who is going to disappear into the Ozarks 
for the next 20 years, it's probably a good idea to get that thyroid out. Yes, please. Just to follow up on that, um, these guys embarrassed me uh, at some meetings because they knew all these codons, and I can't remember, I can't even remember what day it is today half the time. So, so what I've done is I, I put a cheat sheet in front of me. Whenever I go to some of these meetings, I look at this cheat sheet, and to his credit, he's always right because he, he sees these patients regularly. But um, the recent guidelines have changed the uh, classification of uh, these codon specific, specific uh, risk uh, strata, and they've changed it to highest, high, and moderate Nobody, risk. Yeah. And Jeff's quite right. The two codons, that, the one codon that's the highest is the 918, and the second one is the, um, which is that, the 634, I right. guess, yeah. Jeff, and all the others are, are pretty moderate uh, risk. So you've got to be pretty quick on the draw with, the, with these 918s and these um, uh, 634s, especially in young children where you're, uh, you might be considering MEN type uh, 2B. Yeah, yeah. That's in fact the, the, the classification according to the new guidelines. There are three levels of uh, mutation. M1918, uh, that is the mutation of MEN 2B, is the worst, I would say. Then there is the 634, whatever is the change of the the amino acid, and this is considered as IG, and is the, the mutation of the MEN2A. Then there is another mutation that is very rare indeed, that is 883, that can be associated to MEN2B, but it has been demonstrated to be less aggressive than the M1918. And this is important to know about this, because uh, of course the aggressiveness of the disease and the age of appearance of the disease can be different and we can leave the child to become a little bit uh, uh, to grow up a little bit and postpone the surgical treatment later and in the guidelines they uh, in the last guidelines 2015 uh, this uh, approach is uh, well detailed in this uh, table and which uh, they suggest to be very quick with the mutation 1918, um, well, quick but not so quick like in 1918 for 634, and for the others, all the others mutation, we can take into consideration the calcitonin levels, and if the calcitonin levels are uh, undetectable, especially if they are undetectable, we can postpone the, the surgical treatment. What about uh, the uh, mutation, the somatic mutation? Dr. Wong, do you look for somatic mutation in medullary thyroid cancer as a routine or for research? So, uh, for research, I think it's a very interesting and hot area. For routine clinical care, not at present time that I'm aware of, unless Jim has something planned. Um, but it's an intriguing idea because one wonders as we get more and more tools and more and more different RET inhibitors are coming out and we understand Cabo and we understand a little bit more how bandetinib works, there may be a rationale to consider doing what you just said uh, in the event, not for surgery, but in the event that they recur and need systemic theory down the road, there could be a rationale. And Dr. Freeman, do you do in your clinical practice or there is something around you doing this uh, mm. search for no. somatic mutation? No, no, we don't. You don't. And Steve? So we do do this routinely in patients whom we anticipate to require systemic therapies. So okay. uh, distantly metastatic patients who will need systemic therapy, we do routinely look okay. at this. And you choose the, the therapy according to the mutation or? Well, it's becoming more so perhaps. Um, so certainly we know, at least with Cabell's Antonib, there is some survival data that there might be a benefit with RET mutated and RAS mutated uh, sporadic MTCs. Um, uh, there are now, you know, selective RET inhibitors that are going to trial. So I, I think the future is that it may, you know, help to predict who's going to respond to certain therapies. Okay. So there are evidences, and I will go very quick on this, that uh, the presence of a somatic mutation in a sporadic case uh, 
uh, is uh, correlated with a, uh, an aggressiveness of the disease, either with the pathological features of the disease, the tumors are bigger, there are more frequently present the lymph node metastasis, and also with the, um, the outcome of the patients. This is a study from an Italian group in which they correlated the, the presence of the mutation with the key 67, that is a proliferation index, and also with the survival of the patients. And it is clear that RET and key 66 are related to each other, and those patients with the RET mutation had a lower survival with respect to those that were negative. So to know the, pre the, the mutation, the somatic mutation is useful for prognosis. And also, as uh, uh, Steve said, nowadays uh, for, I wouldn't say choose the therapy, but at least to have an idea if it could be a good responder or not. The, the, the issue is that the advanced cases are mutated in uh, almost 90% of cases. That is correlated, of course, with the fact that the mutated cases are more uh, aggressive. So last case for the last uh, 25 minutes. This is an advanced cases, case, so completely different from, uh, from the other. I have a question for Dr. Molly because he was saying something like around. Do you think that the presentation of the disease can um, tell us how will be the prognosis of the patients with the medullary thyroid cancer? I mean, a patient like this from the beginning is different from the patients that we saw before? Yes, I mean, the patient, this patient has stage four disease with distant met metastases, so statistically the patient is going to do more poorly, however, we follow many patients with distant metastases uh, with some of these low-grade RET mutations, these familial uh, medullary thyroid carcinomas, and they just live decade after decade with lung and liver mets. Uh, they tend to, it tends to catch up with them eventually, but it is a slow-growing uh, neuroendocrine tumor, kind of similar to carcinoid. Uh, the uh, the follow-up that is needed to assign absolute numbers to mortality and uh, are not available because you have to follow the patients for 20, 25 years in some cases. But most sporadic patients who present this way, that is non-MEN patients with, who present with distant metastases do not do, not do that well. So what's, been your, what's been your experience with this? Yeah. What's been your experience with Question. it? For me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the stage of the disease is, uh, has a great impact on the, the prognosis of the, the patient. I mean, uh, patients with a, a stage four have, of course, a lower survival and uh, also a much more complicated the disease. Uh, they are usually um, multi-systemic, uh, multi-metastatic patients. Uh, sometimes they have a local disease that is also uh, rather difficult to manage in this kind of patients. So what to do with this kind of patients with uh, multiple distant uh, metastases? Dr. Wong, would you try to make surgery? What would you do? You talk with your oncologist or endocrinologist? I don't know how you are. No, th this looks like disseminated disease. If, if it was just one spot in isolation that were stable, absolutely. We need to do a VATS resection of one targeted lesion, but not in disseminated disease. I think it's important to look at the trajectory to see what the pace of it has been. If it's slow and steady, as Jeff is saying, um, I would consider leaving it alone and just monitoring it. And sometimes it can take many, many, many years before the patient gets into trouble. Once you go down the, 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 the path of starting to, to treat it with a TKI, you know, you're already then, um, first of all, you're subjecting them to risks of the drug. And secondly, your expected benefit is not so, so durable that you could get years and years out of it. Most of these trials, we see benefits of progression-free survival that are less than a year. So um, I would, if, if there's not um, a rapid progression and it's slow and stable, I would, I would just watch. 
and Steve, any alternative uh, to systemic therapy in a patient like this? Potentially. <laughs> <laughs> um, certainly with, you know, as Rich mentioned, with oligometastatic disease, one could consider more targeted approaches, whether it be localized resection or, you know, ablation of an isolated liver metastasis or resection. Um, you know, whether or not there are um, other alternative approaches, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I think the, the advent of, um, you know, things like peptide receptor radionuclide therapy here in the United States and, and whether or not that might ultimately be helpful in medullary, I think that's largely unproven, but that's a potentially exciting line of thinking um, that might, you know, help people who have non-progressive metastatic disease if it, if it knocks it back, similar to going to surgery to knock back, you know, knock the clock back. Um, and delay the, the need for systemic therapy. Um, in terms of cervical disease, certainly, I think everyone's talked about, about that and how, you know, certainly it needs to be recognized that um, if this patient also had s cervical disease, that really the focus is on palliative um, treatment. And so, you know, surgery would definitely be indicated for palliation, um, you know, of, of the neck, even in the presence of widespread distant metastatic disease. And Dr. Molly, if uh, uh, the patient is symptomatic and uh, it's uh, different type of symptoms that can be diarrhea because you know that in advanced uh, disease they can have diarrhea or as it happens in a certain percentage of advanced medullary cancer, he has <coughs> ectopic uh, ACTH syndrome. Uh, would you start systemic therapy independently from the progression of the disease, or still you need to see the progression of the <coughs> disease? Well, yeah, I think that the drugs that are available, for, as I understand it, uh, now I don't personally administer systemic therapy for this disease, but in some patients it's similar, to, as a, again, to carcinoid, you can really improve their symptoms by debulking the disease, and you can do that surgically sometimes. So there is a role for surgery in patients who are symptomatic from metastatic disease if you can just decrease the amount of it, either with, uh, by doing something <coughs> to the liver, or by resecting a large lung mass, or a, a cervical recurrence in the presence of distant disease. Surgery is a reasonable thing to do. In terms of the drugs, I pretty much leave that to the patient and the medical oncologist. Um, my understanding, and we have several experts in the audience here, I think maybe Keith, did I see you in here? Would uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but if a patient is symptomatic and, and doing poorly because of the amount of metastatic disease, it's reasonable to consider uh, one of the new line drugs like cabozantinib or, or uh, caprelsa. Uh, and there are some other drugs available now, and I think that if, uh, but these drugs have significant side effects. Uh, sometimes patients stop taking them, refuse to take them because of the side effects, and so they tend to be reserved for patients who are really failing in some way, either by losing weight and uh, having the dwindles or because they are symptomatic, as you mentioned. So. So, so to comment, since I do prescribe these drugs, and oh, maybe yeah, I can Steve, I can it? help. Um, so, you know, obviously, for those of you who see medullary patients know diarrhea is a very um, difficult problem uh, to manage in, in, in this disease. Um, so, of course, there are other approaches to diarrhea that may or may not be effective. You know, the over-the-counter, you know, medicines, tincture of opium. Um, so certainly severe diarrhea would potentially be an indication to initiate systemic therapy. Our, our, or at least my anecdotal experience is that the diarrhea will often get better but then start to get worse again uh, the longer they stay on, on some of these drugs, um, particularly like cabozantinib, for example. So, but, but certainly it is life-changing, even in the, in the presence of TKI-induced diarrhea, um, that can be very important. In terms of the rare case of ectopic ACTH secretion, it is our approach at our institution. Um, it, you know, one needs to recognize that this is incurable disease, and therefore, although there are good reports of these drugs treating ectopic ACTH secretion, it's not going to cure the situation. And ultimately, at the end of life, it's the Cushing's that hurts us sometimes more than the disease itself, and that's our experience with metastatic neuroendocrine tumors as well. So it's our general philosophy that if life expectancy is considered to be six months or greater, that we go straight to bilateral adrenalectomy in the presence of ectopic Cushing's in medullary cancer. Okay. 
So, um, regarding the when to start the, the therapy, of course, we already said that uh, we, should we should verify that there is a progression of the disease, and the progression of the disease is anticipated by the increase of calcitonin and CA. It has been demonstrated that uh, the, the doubling time of both of them can tell us uh, the, the prognosis of the disease. And of course, if we have a patient with a, a, a calcitonin or a CA that is increasing very rapidly, this is a patient who need to be checked very much more frequently than a patient in which the serum calcitonin is stable. If the calcitonin is stable, we can consider the disease is stable and we can just wait and see. If the calcitonin and the CEA, I would say, is increasing rapidly, they must be checked with the imaging more frequently and uh, eventually treated when the, the, the imaging shows the progression of the disease. Regarding the HCTH syndrome, I pose this question because there are evidences in the literature and there are, this is just one, but there are several cases reported in which it appears that treating the patients with this ectopic syndrome with uh, vandetanib, the, the, the disease improved a lot and then there is a normalization of HCTH and the cortisol. So, probably this can be considered an indication for starting the therapy. And this is uh, the, the, the progression-free survival uh, curves obtained in the clinical trial, the phase three clinical trial with vandetanib. You can see in red are patients treated with the drug and in blue are patients treated with placebo there was a significant increase of the progression-free survival, and this uh, um, allowed the drug to be, um, I can say, approved for the treatment of advanced uh, medullary and progressive medullary thyroid cancer. And this is the same for cabozantinib, and in yellow are the patients treated with cabo, and in white patients treated with placebo, and again you can see that there is a quite impressive difference in the progression-free survival of the two groups. And these are the two drugs that at the moment are approved for the treatment of uh, these uh, patients. But why we should be so careful in managing this drug? So still, somebody, Mo Dr. Molly probably w was saying something about side effect, which is your experience with these two drugs? So, so these drugs can be quite difficult for, for patients uh, to take. Um, you know, when comparing the two, Vendetnib overall has a easier toxicity profile for patients to handle, but has unique risks, of course, like QT prolongation. Um, so, you know, when we think about starting these, there's a couple of things we have to discuss with our patients. One is, you know, once we start, we may not ever be able to stop therapy. Although, anecdotally, I know Dr. Hu and I have a couple of patients who've responded beautifully, and we're actually thinking of taking people off, giving them prolonged drug holidays. So, so we haven't yet proven that this metronomic kind of intermittent treatment might be a long-term uh, solution to kind of balance the toxicities and, and the benefits. Um, but. The, the, the drugs cause serious problems and, and, and um, are potentially, and, and cabozantinib, for example, it can be quite difficult for patients to take, um, and so that what we typically do is uh, start much lower doses than what's recommended um, to use in, in this setting, because it has to be recognized that these patients are gonna be on treatment for years. So you have to find you know, a right dose, a right regimen that they will be able to consistently take. And my experience is that patients can put up with side effects for a few months, but beyond that, it becomes very difficult um, uh, for them to maintain therapy long-term. Okay. So, and these are the, this is the table showing all the adverse uh, events that were in, uh, found during the phase three study with the vandetanib. There are several um, uh, side effects that are present in a 
big number of patients, uh, for example, diarrhea itself uh, or rash, nausea, hypertension, they were present in more than 30% of patients. And this is the list of side effects of cabozantinib and again, also in this case, and I would say even more with cabozantinib, there are a lot of side effects that we have to consider uh, in uh, when we decide to treat these patients uh, with these uh, with these uh, drugs. Anyway, just to uh, coming back to our surgeons, if a patient is taking uh, vandetanib or cabozantinib and there is a lesion in uh, let's say in the liver that is the only one which is growing. Would you think that a surgical treatment of that specific lesion could be helpful, Dr. Freeman? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. Probably not. What do you think, Dr. Molly? Would well, you as suggest? As I mentioned before, yeah, you can have patients who have diarrhea and bulky disease in the neck and you take it out and the diarrhea goes away, or patients who have uh, bulky liver metastases and uh, and the diarrhea goes away after, say, embolization of the liver or chemoembolization of the liver. I've seen that happen uh, several times. So, yeah, I think that it's it's reasonable. It's it's a, the vasoactive uh, substances that these tumors secrete can make patients very sick. So, if you can de decrease the amount of viable tumor by whatever means necessary, you can improve their quality of life. You were talking about surgical resection, weren't you? Or were no. you talking about No, no. I, I mean, in the context of a patient with uh, multiple lesions in the lung, in the, in the liver, who is already taking a systemic, uh, is already in treatment yeah. with the systemic therapy, do you think that the treatment of one single lesion, which is the only one growing uh, during the therapy, could be useful? Oh, so treatment in implies radiofrequency ablation or yeah, anything. Maybe, whatever. Yeah, sure, that's that's worth a try, but I'm, I'm I would be reticent to send that patient for a liver resection. Yeah. You know, no, the no, no, the no, problem no. with, I mean, with that with with medullary thyroid carcinomas, they tend to be very hard and calcified, so it's hard to get a probe into them. If they're in the liver, you know, you stick one of those cryoprobes or a, a, RFA. a radio, RFA probe into them, it, you just break the, the tip of the instrument because they won't go in. So we haven't really done much of that. I, I think the big role is what you say here, say here. It's, it's someone who is not yet on systemics, that if it's just isolated progression, if you attack that, then that may delay the need to go on systemics. So occasionally we will do RFA of liver lesions or do isolated stereotactic body radiation of a growing lymph node in the chest, for example. Um, is there long-term data to say that's effective? No, but, but it does seem to maybe delay the need to go on the, systemics. To delay to the progression. Yeah, but, However, yeah. we have to consider that when we were inside the clinical trial, if the patient had a good response to many lesions, but just one was growing, we had to stop the, the drug. Would you do this in the real life or not? No. no. So this is why, I mean, if there is only one lesion who, that is growing, probably we can also use other kind of therapy for that specific lesion. So any other question or consideration? Are people in the, in the audience? Uh, uh, do you Can want I make to? one? one? Yeah. So just to point out how I think the, the pendulum has swung to, given the availability of the TKIs and their unique toxicity profiles, how we've really moved away uh, from external beam radiation um, of the neck in patients who have had extensive local regional disease for concern that eventually this patient will need systemic therapy and the risk of you know, fistula and perforation and those kind of complications. Um, so at least in our practice, I think we've seen, we've gone away. We didn't talk about external beam and the management of, of medullary, but just wanted to point out that, you know, it's evolving with the, now that we have drugs that actually have some efficacy in this disease. Well, also, what? external beam is not effective in most cases. But historically, it was given routinely. It was given, yeah. but they never <laughs> measured calcitonin levels, and, they, you know, there, uh, there right, was no index of effectiveness. So. I, personally, I've never found it effective, except for bone metastases, it's, it's quite good. 
but in the neck, I've never found it to be effective. But that's my uh, experience with it. And the, if you read the papers, they don't really look at calcitonins or their criteria for response, or they don't follow resist criteria. They're very undisciplined. It's a very undisciplined literature. It's kind of disappointing. Dr. Wang, any comment or conclusion? No, I wanted to uh, take a moment to thank you, for uh, uh, Rosella, for leading a very nice panel. I thought you touched on really all the, the critical points for medullary thyroid cancer, from diagnosis to genetic screening to the importance of the different codon mutations towards you know, local, local regional treatment with surgical decisions, use of calcitonin, then you move to systemic therapy issues. Um, I thought you did a really nice job. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much to everybody. And have a nice...